This is BBC Five Live. It's 10 o'clock. Good morning, this is Anna Foster on Five Live. First this morning, a leading charity has told this programme that a growing number of British couples are looking to Ukraine to help them become parents. It's one of the few countries in the world where you can pay a surrogate. But there are concerns about how some of these agencies operate and whether or not everybody involved is getting a fair deal out of it. We'll hear from a mum who's been through the system. First of all, let's talk about the often controversial area of overseas surrogacy, when couples who can't have children arrange to go abroad and pay someone to carry their child. Now, the leading charity involved in helping people broker arrangements like that has told this programme that Ukraine is emerging as a new market for overseas surrogacy. Uh, Ukraine has a population of only 42 million people, but it features alongside the US as one of the most popular surrogacy destinations for British parents. It raises questions, of course, on how Ukrainian surrogacy agencies work and whether everyone involved is getting a fair deal out of it. Now, in the UK, surrogacy arrangements are altruistic. You can't do it for money. But in the Ukraine, one of Europe's poorest countries, Countries, women can earn up to £14,000 to have someone else's child. Anna, not her real name, was 21 when she became a surrogate. You don't realise this at the beginning, but later, when you get to know the parents, when you see their emotions and feelings, when they're crying and thanking you, you feel how much you've done for them. From the surrogacy, I made about $500 a month. And if you take into account all the payments, including for clothes and for relocation and preparation, then it adds up to $20,000. Those who are preparing to take part should be very careful from the start in the clinic and agency. You read reviews from those who've gone through the programme and find out about their reputation and if there were any negative cases in the way they were treated. Well, let's talk about this with Julia Osievska, who's the director of New Hope, a surrogacy agency in Kiev. Good morning. Hello. Uh, Sam Everingham is from Families Through Surrogacy, a Sydney-based charity that advises would-be parents. Hello, Sam. Hi, Anna. Hi. And Stacey Owen used a Ukrainian surrogate to have her twins in June. Hello, Stacey. Hi, Anna. Uh, talk me through your story, first of all. How are they doing, by the way, your twins? Oh, they're doing really well. They're, they're four months now and they're very happy and peaceful babies. They're just wonderful. You sound full of energy considering you've got <laughs> I actually twins only, that are so small. Yeah, I actually had a really rough night last night and only oh. had an hour's sleep. But well, you're yeah. hiding it really well. Um, <laughs> take me back to how you, well, in fact, take me right back to the beginning, Stacey. How did you come to be looking for a, a surrogate in the first place? Well, I had 12 years of infertility, um, recurrent miscarriage and had all the uh, treatments and drugs and still was unable to carry. And I knew years ago about the surrogacy in India, but then since obviously that's now illegal. Um, so 12 years on, three years ago, I did more research on the basis that it probably wasn't going to happen naturally for me. And um, Ukraine or America was really the only options. And so... Um, why, why was that? Why did it come down to Ukraine or America? Just the only places where you could get it done? Well, where you could pay somebody, right. where, you, where you could pay a surrogate and be sure and have that guarantee that you were going to be able to take your, your baby home. Because obviously here in the UK, that's just not guaranteed, is it? Mm. Um, Ukraine's three-hour flight. Ukraine's a hell of a lot cheaper than America. And the whole process is very different. America almost similar to England in the sense of you find your surrogate, you form a relationship. There's there's things that you have to do and yet there's more involvement. Whereas the Ukraine, because commercial surrogacy is legal, it's more of a business transaction. And so um, we didn't actually find a surrogate. We went with a clinic that was an all-inclusive, all-inclusive um, guaranteed package. So they found the surrogate for us. How did you find the clinic? Well, actually, I googled and there weren't many, you know, two, three years ago um, to, uh, you know, looking now, there are lots of clinics and there's lots of information about Ukraine. But two, three years ago, there was only two or three clinics. And the one I found had a lot of information, a lot of videos. And I spoke to the um, English manager across the course of a year, asking various questions. And so I just I was happy with them. And that's who I went with, because that they, they were the ones that had the most information at that time. Yeah. You also talked about 
being we, you use the word guarantee and, yeah. and as we all know there's never really a guarantee in pregnancy so how does that work well the clinic that we went with we went with an all-inclusive guaranteed package so this means if, no matter what you are going to come home with a baby and now if that took 5 10 15 attempts you're coming home with a baby that's how they worked <laughs> so it was guaranteed so for me for someone that's had you know 10 miscarriages and 12 years of infertility I was willing to pay that price and go through that process knowing that we were going to come home with our own babies did it feel like a, a guarantee because when you've been through something like that and it, it it always feels so far away once you'd signed up to it were you convinced in your mind in your heart that it, it would happen like yeah that? yeah yeah from the very beginning Absolutely, yes. <laughs> and tell me about, because there are different packages that you can choose as well. Yeah, I mean, at the time, our clinic had three. <laughs> you had economy, no longer available, standard and VIP. Um, all of them were guaranteed. All of them were, you know, no, um, uh, no limited attempts. I mean, unlimited attempts. The difference was really in accommodation and having a nanny or having um, additional medical costs paid. Um, so we, at the time, were one of the few brave that went with economy, um, which basically was all-inclusive everything other than our flights. So all we had to do was pay for our flights to get there. We were always collected. We were always given accommodation. We were given food. We were um, taken to and from the hospital. We were taken to the passport office everything was done for us everything now many other agencies and clinics don't work like that but that's that's where that's what we did mm. and how um, often do you have to do you have to go across there well we only went i went at six months to meet the surrogate face to face for our scan um but then we arrived we actually went before they were born many people many people just go when their babies are born um we actually went um when our surrogate was 37 weeks gestation because I was so worried they were going to come early because a lot of twins do and a lot of other people I know going through the process their twins were born way before 36 weeks so we actually arrived early and our twins um, miraculously our amazing surrogate um, carried them for 39 weeks and five days and they were born they were a natural birth really yeah yeah and um, they were pretty big huh they were both over well, uh, my boy was nearly four kilos and my girl was uh, just over three. So we actually arrived there and we were waiting for 16 days um, for them to arrive. And, and I mean, you talk about the, the way that the clinic organises everything. And do you have a, a relationship, any kind of relationship with the, the surrogate? Do you know who they are or have any contact with them? Yeah, OK. So how it works is, is that you do, you, in, within your contract or within the surrogate's contract, is there, is no, there should be no direct contact. So that means that you shouldn't be in direct contact. It all goes through the clinic. So, and, and up until 12 weeks the, the um, clinic will not give you details of the surrogate, which is understandable because there are lots of miscarriages. It's common. And, you know, our first attempt didn't work. Um, so you don't get the surrogate's details for 12 weeks. After that, um, you can you can be in contact. So, for example, you know, in, in my case, um, we wrote to her after 12 weeks. She wrote back. For our 20-week scan, we had our first Skype session. And then I went to meet her at our six-month scan. Um, and then we saw her... Um, a week after the birth and so we had contact throughout did you um, prefer it that way yeah yeah I wanted the choice you see um, this is the thing about England or America you know there's this finding a surrogate and forming a relationship there's that necessity to do that whereas I we, we didn't want to do that we wanted the option we didn't we, we didn't want to have to be involved in that if we didn't want to but as it turns out we were in contact and we remain in contact with a surrogate to this day mm. Is she had she been a surrogate before, or is she likely to do it again? Is it something that she she does a lot? N no. So on our package, um, it wasn't. It, it would be a first time surrogate, um, and she was only twenty when she was um, when they did the transfer. She's twenty one now, um, so it was her first time. That all the surrogates have children. She had a two and a half year old son, and actually, I asked her why she was doing it, and she said that she was doing it for the money and to buy her and her son a home um and i did actually ask her whether she would do it again and she said she wasn't sure but she needed some time to recover so 
Yeah, well, it's understandable. Liz has sent a text in um, and she says, as soon as I heard having a surrogate birth being described as a package, I had to switch off. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get that? People who are concerned about the, the, the commercial element of it? I see, I see people's concerns because I'm in surrogacy um, support groups on social media, so say Facebook, and I see that people have those concerns. I didn't have those concerns. Um, I still don't. And I did ask our surrogate when we was able to how she was treated because there are lots of um, stories going around and you do hear other people's um, nightmare stories. And our surrogate told us that they treated her very well. In fact, they looked after her better than she looks after herself. I mean, they actually housed the surrogates towards the end of the pregnancy and our surrogate was taken in on week 28. So she was in maternity housing. So this means they, ha they home them, they feed them. They scan them every week. They see a doctor every week. Um, she was closely monitored and really looked after. Mm. Anton in Cambridge says, how does a child born in Ukraine to a Ukrainian woman get UK citizenship? That's down to you. So when you apply for your British passport, which is very complicated for surrogacy mm. and took months to prepare before we went, um, you would not believe the amount of paperwork. We had two Lever Arch files for our twins to submit our pass, um, passports. But within that passport application, you have to prove your citizenship. So that's how they get their British citizenship through you. Right. So they, they just have sole British citizenship. Not they're not joint, joint no, nationals or anything no, like that. No, 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 no. So ours have a British passport. Obviously, we're home. So they have British um, citizenship. Yeah. And... Um, uh, Julia's uh, listening to all of this. Uh, Julia, how many British couples do you have coming through your doors at the moment to do this? Uh, at the moment, as of today, we have 11 British couples and uh, three finalised uh, this spring summer. So, But there is definitely an increase, um, raise up numbers after India shut down. So definitely there is a um, bigger amount of clients coming to Ukraine. Uh, British couples uh, chose India before, but I know that there are a few clinics that uh, work with British couples a lot. And I know about the clinic you were talking about. They do have a lot of British couples, yeah. Hmm. And do you do packages like no, the one that, that no, Stacey was I'm talking sorry. about? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, I can't. I do not believe in the idea of guaranteed package because uh, this is something that you can't guarantee. This is pregnancy. Anything can happen. There are we, We've seen a lot during these years of work. There were miscarriages. There were later miscarriages. Or, for example, when you need to do um, uh, delivery when the baby has genetic... For example, recently we had... Uh, heart defect of the baby it was 17 weeks so how can you guarantee that it's just like a natural pregnancy you can't guarantee you don't know what's going to happen mm -hmm. so no we do not get, we do not have those packages there is uh, of course there are, we provide uh, for example help in surrogacy or if you need egg donation that's okay we can also provide that but definitely there is no guarantee in it, it this is the house the you you just can't guarantee that where or how do you find your surrogates? Where do they come from? Uh, they do come from different na uh, regions of Ukraine. The only thing we do not re uh, accept uh, surrogate moms from Crimea or uh, Donetsk region where the clashes are. So normally we prefer Kiev region. Uh, Vinita is like middle of Ukraine, center of Ukraine and closer to Kiev because uh, she needs to come very often to Kiev. That's why the location, it is really, really important. So that's why we have, um, we decided that it's better for us to have some uh, uh, regions that are closer to Kiev and it's easier to get to the city. And what about the ages of the women you use as, as surrogates? What's uh, the minimum age that you'll accept? Uh, minimum, uh, it's um, 21, let's say from 21. But normally I would say that the surrogate moms are of 26, 27, 28. This is the age we actually like because first of all she's mature she understands what she's why she's doing this and uh, they have own children so uh, this is like a perfect age when you are 28 27 it's a so really stacy really said that, that that hers was 20 would that be too young for you 
I, uh, I, I can't, I can't comment on it because you know, uh, maybe she was mature, but uh, it's better to. But but for uh, you, for your it, for your agency, would would if somebody came to you and, and said that they were twenty, would you turn them away? Uh, uh, through the psychologist, we would have a psychologist conversation because you know she needs to be mature. I don't know. I can't say. It depends because some uh, some of the women are twenty six, but they are not mature, and we need to turn them down. Some of them uh, can be twenty one, but obviously understand why they are doing this. So uh, I would say maybe it's too young, but l anything can happen. Anything. I can't. I can't comment mm. on it. So you, you wouldn't. You, yeah, you wouldn't rule it out. And right. One, one of the, the big things in, in surrogacy, of course, is that when a woman has, has carried a, a child, there is every chance that she will become attached to it. She might not want to, to give it away once she's given birth. Have you had any situations like that? No, we didn't, because uh, you work from the surrogate mom from the very beginning, and you tell them. So uh, the the thing is, it comes from, I think it comes from the traditional surrogacy, when there is a genetic link between the baby and the surrogate mom, but in Ukraine it is banned. So that's why the surrogate mom, she understands when she goes into this process, she definitely understands, 100% understands that this is not her baby. Uh, she's just a carrier, and she, uh, first of all, we always encourage not only... Mm, uh, couples to meet the surrogate moms but the surrogate mom it is very important for her to understand why she's doing it for whom she's doing it really it is it is very important so that's why we prefer and we moms meet or at least Skype talk uh, anything just to help them know each other and why they because it is, it is important for her to understand uh, for whom she's doing so that's why it's easy even to, at the end to understand that she's given the baby to the right and to the nice family that's actually willing to have this child so no we didn't have any kind of problems like that Mm -hmm. But at the end, we are ready to it. Uh, there are psychologists that work in with the surrogate moms. But uh, no, uh, it's they understand why they are doing it. So yeah. it's it's fine. Sam, is, is that something that when you're ad advising parents or parents to be who are going down this route, is 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 that something you have to maybe set them up for the, the possibility that that will happen? You mean that the surrogate will want to keep the child? Yeah. No, no, look, it's very, very rare that this ever happens in surrogacy. It's a bit of a, um, a misunderstanding. People assume that surrogates may want to keep the child. Even in countries like the UK and Australia where the surrogate has a right to keep the child, we very, very rarely see that happening. Um, and I think that's because um, they're going into it from the start with the knowledge that they're babysitting someone else's baby and they've had their own families already. Um, for them, it, it really is um, a mixture of altruism and, uh, and getting something out of it. And whether it's a friendship with a couple or whether it's money, um, they really don't want to keep these kids. What tends to happen more often than not is, and the concern the surrogates have is, will the parents come to pick the child up? That's what they worry about. Right. Yeah, yeah. So once, but think, once, once they paid... Yeah, yeah. I mean, we get some couples, you know, it's rare, but some couples where they'll break up and they won't turn up for the birth because the couple sort of uh, just has, hasn't survived the relationship or someone's got sick. And that's the more common scenario you see. Right. Has, has that happened with you, Julia? No, the, the, the thing is that the surrogate mom doesn't want this child. It's not planned. So that's the thing. They just, they just as they are afraid, you know, the first question normally when the couple comes to Ukraine, they, they are afraid of it, that she will keep the child. But, you know, the first question from the surrogate is, will, you, will they take the baby? Because, you know, she, I mean, it's not her baby. She understands what she's doing and why she's doing this. Mm. Stacey, was, was that a concern that, that you ever had in the process? No, because, they're, because, because the Ukrainian law doesn't allow for that to happen. And as Julia said, it's not genetically their child. And I know our surrogate, after speaking to her after, come the end, she was fed up. Can you imagine carrying twins to 39 right. weeks, five days? She was, she was just, we were all like, when are they going to, are they ever going to come? And, you know, I did, you know, throughout my... Um, communication with her the one question i didn't ask her was did she feel anything for them you know did she have any kind of um mm. relate you know any kind of love for them and and i and honestly my feeling was 
No. I mean, she was always... Um, the first thing the surrogate would always be quick to tell you is they're fine. You know, I've had a scan. Everything's fine. The first thing she wanted to do was reassure us that the, that, that the babies were fine. And actually, at the end, she just wanted rid. I mean, she'd been... She'd Which been is away. unusual, because if you think about it, obviously, the, the normal run of things is, is that when you you have the, the child, that, that you, you do keep it, obviously. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she'd been away from her son for 10 weeks, her own family, because uh, the hospital was further out from where she lived. She hadn't seen her family for 10 weeks so what a sacrifice um but no i never worried about that at all yeah sarah wonders on the text if you'd ever considered adopting in the uk that was a last resort for us we wanted a well two things we wanted our a genetically linked baby we wanted our baby and second we didn't want to go down the adoption route that really was a last road for us that that's quite a hard route to go and you don't know whether you're going to get a baby or whether you're even going to get a child so that was kind of a last resort for us mm. there are a couple of people asking as well people are really fascinated in this Stacey and they've, they've got lots of lots of questions that they're yeah. sending in on the text um it was interesting when julia talked about um in one case um a surrogate uh, carrying a baby that at 17 weeks of, of pregnancy was was found to have a heart defect did you ever think about what would have happened if they'd been if the child had been born disabled maybe would that would that just have been part of it for you would you have taken yeah. the child anyway i mean that's a hard question huh because i i didn't really think about that obviously throughout the journey you have your concerns and you worry and you think is everything okay and but you know after the 13 14 weeks they're so thorough they do all of the tests we have in the uk so we knew well, you know, well, there was a high percentage that they were absolutely normal because yeah. in every single scan, they check every single organ. You get a report that they're checking continually. So, so you're saying for you, for you, it's a hypothetical question because you didn't have that. Because yeah. I, I suppose what people are wondering is at what. I think it boils down to at what stage does it feel like your baby? Does it feel like your baby when from or your start. babies? So, so from the start of the pregnancy, mm. you feel like it's your child. I think from when you get that first scan, you know, when we got our first scan was the most emotional day you know from that moment those babies are yours they're not the surrogates as julia said that's so it's nothing to do with the surrogate they're just the carrier those children are yours whether there's something wrong with it or not you would deal with that as and when if you had to you would deal with that then yeah i'm i wouldn't have <laughs> a baby's born in the ukraine and and like julia said that the surrogate worries the parents are not going to come and get it because if the parents don't show up that child's going to go into the care system so for you know if if there was a case if there was something wrong with one of those babies would we not come and get collect it would we not want to know no we mm. still would have gone after after 12 years and, one, and and 12 years of infertility and wanting a family am i going to turn around and say no because there might be something wrong with that baby no yeah. no um die texts in as well from maidstone and, and and asks about the e-word exploitation she says if if you've gone to somebody in a in a poor country and paid money for this are you exploiting them no it's their choice we we pay an agency these surrogates know up front um what you know they, they know the terms they know like julia says they they are given a whole range of tests they're put through psychology you know they see a psychologist they know the ins and the outs they're adults our surrogate was 20 she was young they're adults everyone makes their own decisions you know and as i said in our case and our experience there was no exploitation mm. yeah and i'll just pitch in here we've just done a study of 30 ultra six surrogates in the australian context about how they found their journeys caring for often people they didn't know and the level of exploitation was actually we higher in those unpaid surrogates than it was yeah. in studies with, with paid surrogates just because they found it very hard to ask for expenses to be paid back mm. they found it hard to ask for the basic needs to be looked after because they were worried about the money um, that the parents were having to spend and often those altruistic surrogates suffered a lot more um a lot a lot more than expected to mm. yeah that's um, really interesting isn't it and and uh, stacy a final thought for you beryl in gloucester text to say uh, uh, no one can know the true feeling of being unable to have a baby unless they've been there i had two i've now got six grandchildren good luck to these women who use surrogates <laughs> i'd much prefer the surrogate to be truthful and say i'm doing it for the money mm. what choice do these women have yeah yeah I agree. I mean, a lot of them are doing it for the money because there's never a chance they're going to have that baby. So they are doing it for the money. And what does it, you know, in some people's minds, that's wrong. But that's just an opinion. 
thank you all three. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Stacey. And uh, and good luck. And I hope you get a bit of a nap later on today. At least Stacey Owen, who uh, used a Ukrainian surrogate to have her twins who were born in June. Sam Everingham, who's from uh, Families Through Surrogacy, a charity that advises would-be parents. And Julia Osievska as well, who's the director of New Hope, one of those surrogacy agencies based in Kiev. Um, and thank you for all of your thoughts as well. Um, and questions. You know, I always, if you send a question, I always like to try and put it to the person that we're talking to. Um, so your thoughts, your experiences, if, if this is something that you've done, you've considered maybe, perhaps you're in the process at the moment, 85058 at BBC.